There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, booktube. I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Um, I have absolutely no personal news. All I'm doing is reading, booktubing, and patreoning, and my life is fabulous, so I have no complaints, but I have no personal news. Genji's great. We had a nice chat on the phone, on video chat the other day. Um, he was complaining of the cold, and he has a little hoodie up. He was talking to me outside because his parents don't know that I exist, and that's where he's living right now until he gets to Canada. And he was complaining because it was plus 10. He said, yeah, it's minus 21 here. <laughs> didn't want to make, didn't want to joke about it too much in case it makes him change his mind. No, he's been here in colder weather than that, so uh, he'll he'll be fine. But he doesn't have, he doesn't have as much padding as I do, so he's gonna need a really, really warm coat. But yeah, that the social highlight of my week was last Sunday. Is that right? Yeah, last Sunday. And this will be a lead-in to the highlights of the week. Week in review. I had the first of two. December, I wouldn't dare call them Christmas parties on Zoom for my Patreon members, and that was so fun. I'm There's going to be a highlights video. I'm going to show you just a little thing where it's only me speaking, um, just a, a, a sec, 30 seconds or something, in this review video. But eventually, hopefully soon, it'll be a longer video with some of the highlights of the bookish discussions on and the booktube gossip we got up to so fasten your seat belts for that video and my mom was there because she's a patron <laughs> she's one of my patrons how fabulous is that so people enjoyed meeting her and without further ado here is the week in review I didn't read too too many biographies just partly because i don't know they don't really necessarily come up too too much but i do want to read more and this uh, is just all about Valentine Ackland, who was a poet um, who died uh, right at the end of the 60s. But in all of her life leading up to it had been this sort of not really underground poet, but a poet, a poet who'd never really fully taken off, but had been in a relationship with Sylvia Townsend Warner, who was a more known um, poet. And so as a result, there's this sort of, you know, this lesbian couple who are both poets, who are both, you know, part of this literary scene. Now, I'm just looking at my list of literary mysteries for you. So I just wanted to make sure it's pulled up on my phone. Well, isn't that special? <laughs> <laughs> there going to be a little book bullying going on here? Not at all. Uh, my wonderful mother, who's also a subscriber and a patron, is here. Mom, please introduce yourself. Uh, and I'm in, I'm in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And uh, yeah, I've lived here most of my life. I'm a, a Patreon, and and one of the ones that that I'm picking up the story um, that Sean reads because I used to be the reader to him, so <laughs> it's kind of fun to have it the That's, other way. All right, I've had a very interesting reading week. A lot of good stuff. Some more mixed, more mixed reactions to books that I finished and whatnot than usual, but uh, it certainly hasn't been boring, so let's get started. I have one bail to tell you about, and I finished three, started three. I'm not going to dwell on the bail. It's my new policy that when I'm bail on or don't like a book by a marginalized writer, I don't. I don't make a big fuss about it, but this was not a success for me. This uh, work of an in indigenous short stories that were heavily autobiographical by a Saskatchewan Indigenous woman, Finding Lost by Nancy Lafleur, And great title, fabulous cover, and I quite like the first story, but what I soon realized was she was telling her journey of, of trauma and healing through um, different protagonists in each subsequent story, but it was the same trauma. I, I, again, I, I'm, I'm not going to say much more than that. For me, it got really samey, but it was a different protagonist, and that just didn't work for me. I think this book, um, it's got a very high rating on Goodreads. I think it would be a valuable part of the, um, Indigenous women's healing journeys. It wasn't written for me. It didn't work for me, and that's all I'm going to say. Nancy LaFleur is interesting. She's Woodland Cree from 
Molinosa, Saskatchewan, a place that I'd never heard of. There's an article online about her. I was more interested in it than this book. She makes story skirts and does a lot of storytelling through the skirts she makes. I'll put a couple pictures up on the screen, a link to the article in the show notes. And, uh, you know, uh, just because this book didn't work for me, it's worked for many and many another reader that has rated it quite highly on Goodreads. And um, that's enough said about that. If I do my three books that I've finished in chronological order of finishing, it would also be in term ranking from favorite to least favorite. So let's go with that. The best read of the week, if not the month, a really fantastic book that I've talked about quite a bit already on my channel. Margaret McPherson's memoir, Tracking the Caribou Queen, Memoir of a Settler Girlhood. Finished it early yesterday afternoon, had a fantastic Zoom chat with the author last night. It will come to my channel, it'll get edited and posted in January because there's no point putting up uh, a heavy, a heavy themed video of between now and the end of the month. Nobody's gonna watch it, nobody has time and or the in the right headspace. So. Uh, stay tuned for that in January. What a beautiful writer she is. She, this is her first memoir. She's written a couple novels, a short story collection, and she's been a journalist and had a really interesting life. She's a fascinating person. I, I felt all that from attending the book launch in Saskatoon four or five weeks ago, and now I've read the book. So this is her coming to terms with her settlerhood, her white privilege through a deep probing of childhood memories growing up as a white kid in Yellowknife in the 60s and 70s and having Indigenous friends and being complicit in a lot of the racism that was ingrained in her and ingrained in the society in which those relationships with Indigenous people were complicated, problematized, or prevented from, from occurring. Um, it's just such a beautiful read. It's not overdone. She goes to such great lengths. Like, you could read it as a coming-of-age memoir. You could read it as a coming-of-age novel. She does novelize. She does fictionalize certain things. But it is a true account of, of her coming-of-age in Yellowknife Northwest Territories. It was deeply touching and profound and written in a way to invite white settler people, you wouldn't have to be Canadian, I would argue, white settler people to look in the mirror and come to terms with their own complicity in the trauma we've perpetrated on Indigenous people. Just fantastic. I loved it with all my heart. I'm going to gobble up all of Margaret McPherson's other writings and stay tuned for the discussion video. Next, uh, just this morning on audio, I pretty much abandoned the text because the audiobook was so good. Factory Girls by Michelle Gallen, Gallen's second novel. And I got along with it much better than I reported. Was it just last week I said that I kept falling asleep during the, the uh, maybe it was two weeks ago. Um, that was just something going, weird going on for me. It wasn't as good a novel as her debut, Big Girl, Small Town. But it was a good novel, so I gave it four stars. And I was quite engaged with the second half. It has some huge problems with pacing, especially in the first half. And so it, it's, it's much longer than it needs to be for the, the thinness of the story. B but part of, part of that is forgivable, or part of that um, is not really a criticism in that she, Michelle Gallen paints such a rich picture of the layers of enmeshment that this young 18-year-old Northern Ireland Catholic girl, um, what is her name, Maeve, is stuck in, in this uh, shithole town, which I'm quoting her, I believe. Shite, shite town, I think is what, how she put it. Uh, oh, shitty, shitty wee town. Just like uh, in that last summer before a ceasefire that led to the, to the final cessation of hostilities. So the setting is incredibly vivid. The character work was thin, and I didn't feel that I really got to know anybody in this book as much as I got to know the protagonist in the previous book. And I'm very much of a character-driven reader, and this was much more of a plot-driven novel. So that is a description of just my own preference rather than faulting the book 
but then the plot, after dragging and dragging and dragging the first half, got really uh, engaging in the second half. So I was riveted. Didn't need the book anymore. Just loved the audio narration. Listened to the second half of the book uh, with rapt attention. And whereas it would have been a three-star read uh, if I'd had to assess it in the first half, it became a four-star read. But there was, a, there was still things about it that made it quite a flawed novel. No, especially the cover of the UK edition. What the hell is this? Well, so one more thing to say about the plot is it intricately weaves by the end re religion, sectarianism, gender, and socioeconomic class together into this complex story that has a crescendo of enmeshment. Um, and it was quite well done. So, yeah, and I, I don't, I responded to it. I, I enjoyed it on that level, but I still felt like I didn't really get to know anybody in the book, not even Maeve, the, the protagonist. She wasn't flat on the page, but she only sat up. She didn't stand up. <laughs> she wasn't fully embodied, fully realized either, and then the rest of them were pretty pretty thin. But anyway, I'm glad I read it. It was a buddy read with Heidi of my reading life. Heidi and I haven't checked in with each other on the, the last chunk, so I'm looking forward to to hearing what she thought, and I think she might have liked it a little, at least a bit better than I did. And sadly, this book that I paid about $40 for, and was quite enthusiastic about when I told you I'd started it just last week, has ended up to be one of the shittiest novels I have ever read. What a joke. The sensuous lips on the cover are pretty much all this book had going for it by the end, other than matching my blouse to perfection this morning, but I'm going to rip this to shred. What a shitty novel. So it was quickly apparent to me that this was a piece of shit that the author that was so constipated by his closet, his closetedness could get, could eke out, could force out at the end of his life that the, these people didn't have bodies. It was all about, you know, this chauffeur of lower class and the upper class 17 year old closet queen and he was supposed to be toughening him up with boxing lessons and they did actually get into some kind of a sexual relationship they didn't have bodies i mean there was no sensuality to it thank god for the picture on the cover there was nothing there was no heat there was it was so dry desiccated and part of that to give lp hartley his due was because the kid was so stuck up in his head. But the, the other guy wasn't. He was all body. He was all dick. He was all heat and light. But you didn't feel it. He would describe the chauffeur must giving the kid massages after their workout sessions. But there was no homoeroticism to it. It was just like, I don't know. He was writing it like it was a scientific report. It was just awful. and But it still held my interest as kind of a literary artifact of the closet and the, and the the restraint that that closet put on this otherwise very gifted writer based on the one novel of his I've read, the one novel that a lot of us, us have read, uh, The Go-Between, that was about, you know, sexuality and the awakening from childhood to realize how, how horny and, and uh, screwed up adults are. But I couldn't get the image of him off the toilet trying to shit this book out and straining and straining and straining. And it was just, it was this really strange, strained piece of shit novel. It's one of the worst I've ever read by the end, especially because the ending was just putrid. Just, it was so bad. And the thinness of all the other characters and the way suddenly explosions of emotion came out on these characters that just I was ready to puke it was so bad oh um let's see am I how much of a minority voice am I <laughs> I don't think the rating is that great on it but uh, I gave it one star <laughs> yeah there's a 3.5 rating which I think is very generous it's mostly must be a rating of the cover I it's not gonna get sound stop me from reading his backlist and I'd I would actually love to reread the go-between as early as next year but unless you're interested in reading it for its historical value as a writer of a certain age but I mean compare it to Maurice which I haven't read for years but uh, based on the testimony of people like Greg of supposedly fun 
does really stand up as a sensual, really embodied narrative of queer longing. This just stunk. There's an essay at the beginning, which I was looking forward to reading, by the queer scholar Gregory Woods, but I'm, I didn't, I'm not going to waste my time reading it. I remember flipping through it and seeing, uh, I read half a sentence. Oh, the last paragraph, the, I read, despite its shortcomings, the harvest room can be seen as blah, blah, blah. Well, the shortcomings, there's no despite. Just, um, what a waste of time. So that's what I finished. And hate reading is fun. So I, you, some of you have probably noticed, I don't rant and rave about books I don't like as much as I used to. And I have maybe grown up a bit. I would I hesitate to put it that way. And if I have grown up, uh, part of that has been through realizing that living authors will find my review. So many of them have have eventually seen and commented on or whatever, or for, or I've found out because they subtweeted me when I've done takedown reviews. And I'm not doing this to hurt writers' feelings. I also believe that I get to talk about my reactions. But when it's a living writer who is not famous, who is not, you know, a best-selling, you know, very, very uh, well-regarded writer, I do not do those takedown reviews. So. Hey, well, I didn't quite finish the thought. So, I will do takedown reviews if I feel they are warranted of famous prize-winning, highly regarded living authors. Or authors who are dead. So it was quite delicious to tell you how much, how deeply and how much I hated this shitty novel by a dead writer. I will not hold back when it's somebody who's, you know, at the upper echelons of regard or wealth or, or uh, fame. They're fair game. But uh, not, not beyond that, I, I, uh, I pull my punches. So... So that, I feel good. I feel, got that out of my system. I feel really good. <laughs> All right. I have started three. I have started Five Days Untold, the Yemeni novel by Badr Ahmad, translated by Christian James. James. I haven't gotten very far into it, but it is gripping. It's very propulsive. And it's set in the Yemeni Civil War with a really layered look at one particular family in a small village. And then uh, just getting to the part where Despite the son having some kind of an exemption from having to fight, he's been drafted. And I think it's because the war has gone going so badly that they're just pulling anybody they can into service. But basically spent the first 30 or 40 pages creating a tapestry, a really deep look at his family going back at least three generations. And it's just really well done. So... Dar Arab Press is really one that you should be checking out. If this continues to go as well, and much as I loved uh, Without by Yunus Alakazami, that would be uh, two for two, so I really hope that it continues to go well. This is the one that I've seen that I have, it's the only one I've actually seen that some people, uh, some of my Twitter bookish buddies like Ronan Hashim have read and, and spoken highly of. I haven't heard much about any of the other novels, and I've got two others on the shelf, but this one. I certainly see what all the fuss is about. And I have just gotten a bare start on this Italian-Romanian novel. It's by an Italian writer set in mostly Romania. If You Kept a Record of Sins by Andrea Bajani, translated from the Italian by Elizabeth Harris. And yet starting out really good. It's it's a strange little story. So the the son is either like a, a teenager or maybe even older, a little bit older than that. It opens with him flying to Romania after his mother died suddenly, not very old, and she was a businesswoman, and he had visited her there as a kid, but she had started this business in Italy, and then it had gone to Romania. I quite, don't quite understand yet why, other than perhaps cheaper labor. I have no idea. But the business, I've just gotten, just read this morning the chapter, that the business was this egg-shaped contraption that obese people would sit inside and it would help them lose weight. Sounds really interesting. I'd like to try it, but don't know how, why she died. Don't know anything more than that. It's a short book. Uh, I, I may even finish it this week, although I've only gotten 30 pages in. It's uh, 200 pages with this kind of a boxy-shaped book. So far, it has held my interest. 
And uh, you might want to be sitting down for this because I, I wasn't planning to try this, but I had the book out from the library and then I had requested through Libby the audiobook and it came in and I thought, well, Sean, just listen to the first story and see what you think. So I did and I just grabbed me, wouldn't let go. So I am now, almost against my will, embarked upon reading this Giller-nominated short story collection, Lesser Known Monsters of the 21st Century by Kim Fu. Kim Fu is, is an American-Canadian writer. She lives in Seattle, but she must have been born in Canada because she was on the Giller list for this book. I don't know if she got to the short list or anything, but the first story just knocked my socks off, and it knocked my socks off despite being kind of sci-fi or something. <laughs> I don't know what it was because I read so little genre fiction, I don't even know which, uh, which what to... Described it wasn't fantasy, but it was one of the most moving short stories I've read all year. So the premise is that there is this machine, a simulator, that you can have any experience you want. Uh, you can enact a sexual fantasy, you can spend time with a famous person, you can go back into history. I can't remember the parameters, but pretty much any of that kind of stuff. But this woman is having the pre-screening, and it's all done just as a script, as dialogue. And I'm doing, the audio of this was masterful. Two voices. Man's, the man was the, the uh, staff person, and then the woman was the one who was being prepared to go into the simulator machine. She wanted the, to have the experience of um, spending time at a, what do you call it, a herbarium or something, like a, one of those plant zoos or whatever they're called that's not terrarium but i don't know natural museum or something with her recently deceased mother because she remembers spending that time with her mother i don't remember if it was the last time she'd seen her mother before she died but it was, it was a an experience she wanted to re-experience in simulation and be much more attentive to her mother because she spent the whole time kind of on her phone and not really engaged with her mother and she would like to have the experience of doing it over. So that's very moving premise in this kind of sci-fi setting. And the guy said it's against company policy. We can't have you, we don't allow people to, and I'm going to shut up in a minute about this plot because you should just read the story. We're not allowed to, to have you simulate an experience with a, a relative or close friend who's no longer living it's just it's too addictive and blah 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 and then the back and forth about that and how the story ends it's so beautiful that i was verklempt by a freaking sf story I had to call lindy right away on voxer and tell her if he was pleased so yeah i'm gonna keep going with it to be honest the second one was about uh, a girl that's growing wings out of her ankles or something and that one that left me cold but i'm hoping some of the other ones grabbed me but the first one is pre-simulation consultation XF007867 was masterful. What a great surprise this was. So that's what I've started. I have room on my roster for three more. And here's what I think they will be. I definitely, one of them will be Tinkers by Paul Harding, this ugly library copy. And didn't this win the booker? It was nominated for the booker. I think it won the booker, but I, I don't know. I don't care. It doesn't matter. I had a copy on my shelves, and it was one that didn't make the cut when I came back to Canada. I got rid of it. And I don't know if I sent it to one of you or if I sold it. I don't know what I did with it, but I don't have it anymore. And I think Joe and I are finally going to have a start up our buddy reading, our back-to-back -back buddy reads. We had been doing for years, and then I had shut down my buddy reads um, to get ready to because I just didn't, couldn't sustain that kind of stuff when I was so busy moving and whatnot. So we're finally gonna get back into the groove and she suggested this one because she saw it on my TBR. I said, okay, well, I don't have the copy anymore. So here's a library copy. It's a fairly well-known book. I'm not gonna look at the synopsis, mostly because um, I couldn't read that small type for love nor money. <laughs> Tell you more about it next week. And as if I don't have enough of books of my own to, to read, but I, I found this browsing at the branch library down the street. And this is a book that I don't remember hearing anything about, but presumably 
I did because it was on the Giller long list and published in 2022. So Lindy must have talked about it with me. So it's obviously from Canada. It's called Lucienne and Olivia by Andre Narbonne. And I believe it was written in English. Yes, and published by Black Moss Press in 2022. So uh, here's another one for in December. It's short and I'm curious about it. Comic statement on the beautiful waywardness of life. It sounds maybe more political than I might like. It's set in the 80s. Lucien is a marine engineer on a Canadian tanker. He meets Olivia, a brilliant philosophy student. The story goes from there. And this is one I, I did have on my In December TBR from Seagull Books. Boat number five by Monica Kopanakova, translated by Janet Livingston. And Kopanakova is a Slovak writer. The protagonist emotionally neglected by her immature, promiscuous mother and made to care for her cantankerous dying grandmother. Well, that sounds like a Sean book. And it's not very long either. That's, that's my weekly report. How did I do? Thanks for watching. Oh.